Thank you very much for that kind uh, introduction, Dr. Suzuki. Um, as you'll see in a few moments, uh, you do have a, a, a very distinguished set of speakers uh, today. I'll, you'll see that I'm probably the least distinguished uh, of them. Uh, but I want you to, uh, to know that uh, despite the fact that I've been kind of in industry and not so much uh, in a speaking mode over the last 30 years, that uh, um, there's still interesting things going on uh, within industry, and I'm ho hoping to tell you a little bit about what's happening. Um, some of what I'm going to say is kind of from an industry point of view. It might be interesting to you to see what industry is interested in, and in your own uh, world of how you deal with magnetics, you may see uh, some things that are interesting with respect to how you approach uh, certain problems and how at least uh, um, I and my colleagues have been looking at uh, some of the problems that are facing us within uh, magnetic recording. And uh, one of the, and by the way, uh, before I forget, may I uh, say congratulations for choosing a wonderful field to look at. It's an extremely rich set of uh, phenomena that uh, we can look at, uh, play with, and also make some money with um, uh, somehow. There's a lot of uh, uh, rich uh, phenomena that occur. I'll be talking about a set of, uh, I guess we call it interdisciplinary uh, problems that uh, have come up in the magnetic recording industry. So I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, a few things relative to how we model um, some magnetic recording. This is going to be somewhat tutorial. I apologize if someone, many of you are already experts in the area. Uh, these uh, DL uh, talks are supposed to be semi-tutorial so that you can, uh, so that the general audience can see, but I hope that uh, I'll be able to confuse you by the end of the talk. <laughs> won't, won't all be tutorial. Uh, I and my colleagues are here on the behest of the IEEE Magnetic Society. Uh, please join. Uh, th th those of you who um, are trying to get something published, I want to make you aware that there's also a relatively new opportunity for you to publish uh, things quickly in the IEEE Magnetics Letters. This is a, um, let's see, apparently it's about 10 days between submission and acceptance. Uh, and they're trying to hold very tightly to the 10 days. So if you'd like to get a short paper, you know, three or four pages uh, published uh, quickly, this is a terrific opportunity. Hope you'll take advantage of it. Uh, my talk is at least two hours long, um, <laughs> of which I can pick several uh, topics. Uh, in, in today's uh, uh, pitch, I'm going to be uh, talking about two-dimensional magnetic recording, uh, TDMR. It's been, magnetic recording has been in at least two dimensions since its, its uh, start, maybe three or four dimensions. Uh, but I hope at the end of the chat you'll be able to know wh what we mean by two-dimensional recording. And uh, the best way to do that is start talking about uh, models of how that we, how, how that we uh, are starting to look at the recording subsystem. Uh, not necessarily from a deep uh, uh, scientific point of view, although it, there certainly is that un underneath the covers, uh, but kind of at a system level to say what happens at the write process and what happens in the reading process with enough uh, complexity in the model that, that it will actually have something to do with what we actually measure. And uh, uh, I've uh, chosen a couple different models to kind of give you a view into what that looks like in two dimensions. And that really means those two dimensions, by the way, are the dimensions of the plane and the disk, the down track direction and the cross track direction. Um, then uh, we'll have time to talk about, I think, some uh, testing problems in two dimensions. Testing is itself a technology, and uh, it's nice to actually try to uh, take what we think is happening in theory and, and uh, take some different ways to look at testing, also in two dimensions, and see if we can see some relationship between the two. TDMR is also a signal processing technology in two dimensions. That is, it takes multiple signals out of out of uh, the recording system and tries to do something about it. That is the extra hour that uh, we probably won't get to in this, in this time. Um, not to take anything uh, for granted, the, this is a hard disk drive. It hasn't changed in a long time, 50 years, except maybe the colors and the size. Um, 
This used to be, when I started, this was brown or red, made out of red barn paint. And uh, we recorded information uh, with iron particles that are in that paint. Uh, now we are using thin film materials, cobalt, platinum, chrome uh, type materials, so they're shiny now. But other than that, uh, these machines look very like they used to, just like a bicycle, except, uh, uh, except a little different. Lots of different kinds of magnetics in this machine. Uh, we have motors uh, that spin the disc. We've got uh, motors that move the actuator back and forth. And uh, we'll be talking about what happens in the plane of this media. And also, at the very end of this uh, actuator, there's some interesting uh, problems and materials to both write the information onto the disc and read it back. We'll be talking about uh, those in a minute. Here's an old picture of what a recording head looks like. There are four wires going into it these days. Uh, two of the wires are for the writing process. We pump current either in one direction or in the other direction. And uh, that current generates a field which then leaves magnets on the disk. Uh, the other, and it used to be that's the only system that we had, that we'd also use inductive uh, helping to read back the information. But 20 years ago or so, we separated the two processes. And now we hang a piece of magnetoresistive material over the media. And uh, that uh, magnetoresistance effects changes, uh, allows us to read back uh, the signals. And that's how we go. Two-dimensional mag magnetic recording, in essence, is adding more wires to this picture. And the most likely thing that's going to happen next is we're going to be adding these wires in the readers. And we're going to add more sensors to the problem. Someday, maybe there might be multiple writers as well, but uh, uh, at the moment, that's quite difficult. <laughs> so we'll be, uh, uh, we'll be looking at that soon. Here's what's happening. Let's see, did I skip something? Here's what uh, TDMR will look like. If, we, if you can imagine this picture being several different uh, tracks, uh, and these are down track directions and go all the way around the disk, if you like. In uh, today's system, we have one reader, which is a small fraction of the track pitch. These dimensions of a track pitch, the distance between here and here today is about 50 nanometers. And the down track distance for a bit is about 10 nanometers or so, something like that. Uh, today's reader is a small fraction of that track pitch. Um, uh, therefore, the physical width of it is something like uh, 25 or 30 nanometers in, in drives that will be coming out uh, this year or next year. The reason that it's so small compared with the track pitch uh, isn't because we don't like big heads. We actually do like <laughs> uh, to make bigger heads. They're easy to make. They're easier to make uh, stable. Um, but the problem is if you make a wide head, it will read information from the other tracks. And the signal processing uh, folks within the hard drive industry, which I represent, don't like that at the moment. We say that that's evil and that if we try to read stuff on the off-track, off that looks like noise to us, confuses the signal processing. So uh, for that and actually several other reasons, we try to keep this reader uh, small compared to a, a track pitch. Another reason, by the way, is that this is a mechanical machine. If you move this reader back and forth on top of the track, which is what happens uh, in actuality, um, if the reader is small compared to the track width, you don't get much change in the outputs. So you have a certain amount of robustness with respect to the mechanical problems. By the way, that mechanical variation is something like a couple of nanometers, uh, one sigma, uh, which is pretty good for a cantilevered system. <laughs> out there in the middle of nowhere. Um, another uh, amazing part of the hard disk drive industry is that, is that control system. TDMR, as opposed to this system, is quite different in, in uh, sort of its basic philosophy. Uh, TDMR might have uh, several different heads. Here I, I uh, drew three of them. And one of the things that we're trying to do is break this rule of the of the reading width trying to be a small fraction of the track pitch. Um, we do that for several uh, reasons. Some of them, as I already mentioned, the difficulty of making very small heads. 
But actually, there's a signal processing advantage that we can get by having multiple readers that uh, are now spanning several different tracks. Um, in this way, instead of being uh, scared of what's happening on the off-track uh, information, we are now going to be embracing it. And uh, we're hoping that we can get uh, both the relief to the uh, manufacturing and design requirements of the heads themselves, but we'll also get an aerial density benefit because the, of the uh, uh, sort of the marrying, if you like, of the information between several different tracks, which we currently separate. Um, to be able to do this kind of technology, we need to start thinking in two dimensions. Um, in a standard case, we, most of our models that I've been working with over the last few decades are basically one-dimensional. That is, we can look at a signal and uh, we only look at it in one dimension, what happens in the downtrack direction, or versus time, if you like. Uh, because things aren't supposed to change too much if you move back and forth. And maybe it's one and a half dimensions. But in this kind of system, it's clearly a two-dimensional system, both in the writing process, to be able to write these tracks. We now have to care what's in the middle of the tracks. And uh, on the writing part, but also on the reading part, um, we're clearly reading more than one signal at a time. And this is also uh, two-dimensional in the signal processing. So for both of those reasons, um, my version of what we call these, uh, TDMR is uh, two-dimensional. And this is the reason for it. Five years ago, uh, those of us in the industry and research were making charts like this. I want to show it to you not because uh, it's all correct. It actually isn't all correct, at least not anymore. Um, and, uh, but there are some things that are actually are true. We are kind of stuck at this one terabit per square inch at the moment. That's true. And we are uh, fiddling with uh, trying to make PMR uh, go. Uh, it used to be that uh, that slope was something on the order of 20 to 40 to 60 percent aerial density benefit per year. Now we're talking more like 5 percent or even less. If we do 1% improvement by basic phenomena uh, in the recording system or electronics, uh, it's a good month's work uh, today. So we actually are on that, on that curve. And we're trying to do things that uh, would sort of maybe normally be too complicated <laughs> to try to step up those things. TDMR used to be in the heroic region, <laughs> very heroic region at uh, 100 terabits per square inch. Um, and it was slightly, it was defined somewhat differently uh, when it was first proposed by Roger uh, Wood 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, TDMR is now, instead of being at something that will never happen in my lifetime, and probably not in yours, uh, to something that may be happening next year. Uh, last month at the TMRC um, uh, conference, um, everybody gets together and says, well, what do we think is going to happen? Um, and when. And uh, all of the other uh, technologies are writing type technologies. I won't talk about them. I think you'll hear more about them uh, later today. Hammer, uh, Mammer, and, and Bitpatter Media. Uh, this is a distribution of the respondents of what's actually going to happen next. And uh, TDMR used to be you know, in the heroic region. Now it's the next thing that's going to be shipped, according to this uh, survey. And uh, it's going to be coming out in 2016. And in industry terms, that means by 2010 or so. <laughs> but uh, it, it, it does definitely look like it's the uh, next thing uh, to happen. Um, unlike all these other alphabet soup that you see here, um, TDMR is a reading technology. Right? We're adding readers. And as such, it's actually compatible with all of the other ones, which is why Industry people uh, will think it's an adv advantage. If we, can if we have to do all this extra work, which it is quite a bit of extra work, as you'll see, um, we'd like it to be able to be applicable to anything else that's happening. And as you'll, if you'll keep that in mind throughout my presentation, um, you might see that, in fact, that's, that's true. And that's essentially because uh, we can piggyback any kind of writing technology with any kind of reading technology like, uh, like TDMR. And it might actually come out in 2016. It's pretty conventional. Okay, um, 
This relationship has been around for at least 75 years. Uh, people are still making papers out of it, uh, beautiful papers. And, and uh, it is basically the reason uh, that I'm here and recording uh, happens, the old Stoner and Wolfarth relationship. Um, I'm going to be taking this slightly in a different context uh, because what I'm trying to do here is create a right model that's, um, that happens in two dimensions. But I also want to create a model which is a stochastic one. Um, one of the fundamental truths about our business is that when you write something, we actually don't write it the same way every time. Fundamentally, we can't write it the same way every time. Even if the head was in the same position, in the same fly height, at the same, et cetera, we have a fundamentally stochastic uh, phenomena governing our write process and causing 90% uh, of the noise that's present in our, present in our system. And so I, I need to make a model which is, is uh, uh, somehow respects this fact, and I'll show you a, a simple one. But uh, this relation, the simple relationship, which will lead to that simple understanding, is purely that if you have a small enough particle, there aren't going to be any domain walls and confusing things like that, and you only see an energy relationship that relates the uh, magnetization and the angle with respect to the easy axis of such a particle. Uh, in the, uh, if you have no external field, which uh, is what happens when we write. But without any external field, that particle is only happy being up or down in the simple case. And it'll stay there, we hope. Um, and then uh, that's, the, that's the fundamental nature of our, our recording system. If you can somehow get it to be up and down, it'll stay there. Uh, with one little important caveat in that uh, uh, depending on the volume and some properties of the, of the uh, system, uh, that energy barrier might be small or, or large. We have uh, thermal energy that can kick us over this barrier, such that spontaneously, even without any field, we can go from being up uh, to being down. And generally speaking, if we have a bigger number in these things, that, that uh, model will go higher. Unfortunately, it's proportional to the volume, so the higher density that we go, that energy gets smaller. and. Uh, since we in the hard drive industry want to make sure that your Facebook pictures last a month or two, um, we want to make this thing uh, high relative to the thermal energy that's likely to be around. The number is actually seven years is the specification. So please make sure that you copy your uh, thing somewhere. All right. Uh, the writing process is adding a field at some other angle. And uh, you can work through the equations and uh, look at it. If the field is high enough, the magnetization will be parallel with the field that you had. But uh, you have to have a pretty hefty field to oppose this thing and write with high probability. So if you have a field uh, opposing, and I showed a draw this here, you'll see the blue line. Um, even though it's going up, now I've got a field that's opposing it. You have a metastable state here that if there's enough uh, thermal energy at the moment, you can, uh, it'll write, if you like, in that direction. But there's a pretty high probability that it will stay here. In a lot of our systems, it uh, won't, it doesn't matter too much. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of times, if we're writing a very long magnet, we can write with very high probability. But in fact, a lot of where the interesting things happen in our in recording subsystems we actually don't know the probability, or we don't, we know the probability perhaps, but we don't know whether or not it's going to be up or down. And so uh, to capture that kind of uh, uh, phenomena, I, I'm showing a, a simple model uh, which shows that uh, we, we care about two different things in the probability of whether or not this thing is actually going to uh, flip. We have two different energy barriers depending on whether the particle was up or down, but there is an energy barrier. Uh, that's this big in this case, and that big in that case. And we compare that with the thermal energy, kT, and exponentiate it. That'll give you the probability that it actually flips, approximately. And that probability machine, if you like, runs at 
let's call it a discrete time, it's some, something on the order of a third of a nanosecond with the, uh, in our recording systems. So depending on whatever field is present to, at the grain that we try to provoke by the writing system, uh, we can calculate the probability that it's going to flip from where it is uh, now, depending on our pre-knowledge of it, if it's up or down. That is called the attempt frequency. How fast do we flip this Bernoulli coin? Um, it turns out that uh, even if the probability is quite small that it flips, uh, you can be over, that probability can be overwhelmed by the number of times it's flipped. It's flipped about 10 to the 10th time since we've started talking. And, and uh, so the probabilities have to be very low for it to be not a problem. So here's the probabilities uh, under uh, no field, depending on if it was plus or minus. Probabilities with some very poor thermal stability numbers uh, are on the order of 10 to the minus 20. That's not good enough because uh, over seven years we want the probability that it not flip to be, to be high. Um, to be able to handle this kind of uh, evolution of probability, it's quite uh, nice to use the Markov model uh, system to do that. Here we have the very simplest kind of Markov model. It only depends on the previous uh, history, um, uh, the previous one level history, and that is, is it up or is it down? This is describing one particle, and we're trying to keep track in a Markov system, what is the probability that it's up or down? of course related very simply. If you, if you know the probability that it's, that it's up, the probability that it's down is 1 minus that, that p. So the way this works is we present a field to the, we start with a probability and we present a field at the ith instant. And perhaps that probability that it flips given that field is 0.1, let's say, and we started in the up direction. So the probability of being down is 0. In this new instant, then, the probability that we'll be uh, in this stage is 0.9. And the probability that we actually move to this stage is 0.1. And we can keep track of these kind of probabilities very easy. It's only a function of the h uh, that's present there. And somewhat nicely, um, you can work through the probability rules and find that the that you can transform the old probabilities to the new probabilities given the new H's uh, simply by a, a transition matrix. And by putting together all of those matrices, that is, in the next instance, there'll be another matrix and another matrix and another matrix. Any field history can be represented by one matrix, which is the product of all the other matrices, independent of what the uh, probability was at the beginning. So here's an example. Um, let's say we have a, a, a grain in the middle of that right field, which we drag across uh, the media. And that produces a field, which is the green, um, the green system here. And here you can see I'm flipping the polarity. This is what we do. We flip the polarity of the field by changing the polarity of the right current to the system. And uh, using the probability uh, numbers I showed you before, we're going to start at the probability of one-half, uh, which is sort of an AC erase condition. And then we can watch the probability lag somewhat, the, the field itself. But had we stopped the field to be zero at any time, we would have uh, ended up with that probability. In this case, the probability turns out to be zero, that it's up with this field, which meaning the probability is very high that it's written negative. So now I can start finally writing things in two dimensions and make prettier pictures based off this system. We have that same right field dragging across a, sis a, a head or a, a disk, and we change the right current in some particular pattern. And you can see I've written one track, two tracks, and three tracks, uh, leaving information on the disk. What you see here is the map of the probability. If it's deep, Blue, the probability is very high that it's in the that a grain at that position would be in an up direction. If it's uh, deep red, then the probability is very high that it will be in the negative direction. Okay. Uh, this is, by the way, what we call shingled recording. I won't talk about it too much, but uh, 
SMR, as it's known, means that the head writing is wider than the track pitch. And it, actually it's symbiotic with TDMR, and the TDMR is trying to solve the relationship of the reading width to the, to the uh, track pitch. SMR solved the problems of the writing width with respect to the track pitch. So we decouple them, and they can be wider. See, this head is writing much wider than a track is. But you can do that by leaving, <laughs> by writing, and then leaving pieces of the track here. This isn't the new track pitch. One thing that's interesting about this kind of model, which is actually true in the real world, is that this edge on the top here is quite sharp relative to the bottom edge, which is fuzzy. The reason for that is, uh, you remember the actuator moves like this? It's on a rotary system. And so that means that the, the, the axis of this uh, symmetry is broken. It is maybe goes from plus 15 degrees to minus 15 degrees. It means that this edge up here is quite sharp. And you grains along this edge only see large fields for small, small times. And probably, uh, well, it's still slightly fuzzy. It's quite easy for those grains to understand what they're supposed to be doing. On the edge, the bottom edge, though, those grains see large fields for uh, a long time and possibly over many, uh, many polarities. And so these grains are quite confused about what they're supposed to do, and they end up not knowing that because of that. This means that you'd, and uh, this means that you would always write like to write in this condition, writing this one, and then this one, and then this one. In this case, because we are always overwriting the poor edge and not leaving our dirty laundry, leaving it, leaving the clean part. You can t since this is a very simple model, you can just take this set of probabilities and generate the variance of those grains that would have been at, the, the, at those positions. It's just, since it's a Bernoulli variable, it's just 1 minus p times p. Does everybody see that it's noisy when you have transitions? In the middle of a long transition, there's almost no noise. You always have our biggest noise in the place of the transitions. And, uh, we always knew that in one dimension, but now it becomes a clear relief that it happened. Those transitions also happen in the cross-track direction. So these transitions now are also noisy. Okay. When we write at high density, which is kind of what we have to do uh, to get any information on the disk, you can see that the probabilities never quite reach one or zero. In fact, in many cases, these probabilities might be only 0.6 or 0.7, slightly biased to the right direction. <laughs> And that's, our, that's where we are today. That's our, our noises are that big. We'd, uh, we, if, if we could always write long magnets, we, we would know pretty much what we wrote. But since we have to write short magnets, um, those probabilities aren't high. So we, this gives rise to disk noise, which is a, the dominant factor in our current systems. Here's what happens if we go the other way. Now I've moved from the inner diameter to the outer diameter, perhaps. And now I write one, two, three. Now this is a much worse system uh, because we're always leaving the fuzzy edge when we write. It's the wrong way shingling. It's like trying to build a roof from the top down instead of bottom up. Yeah. That's the. Uh, you can do that in recording as well. So in actual SMR drives, we always start at the extremities and st write towards the middle with the heads that we have, and this is the reason why. Okay, I need to move on to some other uh, phenomena, but this is kind of, this is a very simple model based off a long time ago uh, uh, model, but uh, I've extended it somewhat in that we, in to show the fact that we actually have a probabilistic system when we write. But I've been way too simple in what actually happens. Media aren't actually infinitesimal, small piece, small grains, uh, <laughs> not at all. Um, in fact, the, the size of these grains are uh, something like eight or nine uh, nanometers in diameter, uh, a very substantial portion of a bit cell. And so that quantization is uh, another noise issue, if you like. And they are not regular at all. And they look something like this. And uh, I've also ignored uh, other uh, phenomena and people who are actually doing the real modeling uh, will take into account the fact that uh, 
uh, those grains do interact with each other. I've been kind of ignoring that fact up to this point, and I'm going to continue to ignore it, but uh, those of us doing the modeling won't. Uh, the two important effects there are uh, exchange between adjacent uh, grains. Th that exchange uh, will tend to align adjacent grains. That is, if one happens to be up, the next one is more likely to be also up. And in such a way, we, we introduce correlations between what you might think of as an independent noises. Um, and the other thing that's important is th those grains themselves generate fields, which are the same as writing fields. And uh, if you're up, going up, you'll generate demagnetization fields, which will tend to oppose uh, the uh, other, the, the direction for grains that are uh, nearby but farther away as well. And both of those effects uh, need to be taken into account of in a, in, a, in a real model. However, if you ignore these things, we still see at a high level about the right thing. You can see that things are fuzzy in one direction and the probabilities that we're up or down uh, are like that. I'm going to move on to the uh, reading process in two dimensions. This one's, if you like, a bit simpler. Uh, in that uh, what we really care about, I'll have to have you believe that this reading system is a linear system, which might mean something to you signal processors. Um, but we typically use something called the read sensitivity function. This function is also known as the two-dimensional impulse response to use signal processors. It's also known as the point spread function to those people of you who know radar. Um, it's all exactly the same function, and what it means is um, if you have a very small test grain in the plane of the media and you move it around in the x and y direction, how will the head respond to that as, uh, uh, in uh, some sort of signal output uh, to that grain? You might expect, and it certainly happens, that if your grain is right underneath the head in the middle of it, you'll get some sort of uh, function which is maximum in the middle. But if you move side to side, the function will uh, go off in some prescribed manner. And then if you go in the downtrack direction, it also will go up and down. By the way, you can see the aspect ratio of a recording system is about four to one from this picture. Tracks are four or five, six times wider than a bit is. And you can see that in the, re in the uh, read sensitivity function. Uh, we won't have time to talk about the, uh, the physics of why that happens, but it, uh, let me just uh, state that it's, one way to model this is, is to say that every uh, little piece of this stripe changes the conductance of that little piece, dependent on the vertical field that's present from this little test grain. And to get the entire effect, uh, we can get up, we can get the change in conductance, not the resistance, although you could call it resistance if you like, um, of everything just by um, adding up all the little effects due to that in every part of the stripe. And uh, the way we sense this is we put a plate on one side and the other side and put a constant voltage across it and then uh, look at the current that changes. And that's, that's, how we, that's how we sense it. But uh, what we're interested in uh, today is to look at what, how do we characterize that read sensitivity function. Um, it, is, uh, it will look, some, look something like that. In fact, this is a, depending on what level that you'd like to do your modeling, it's a fairly standard um, quasi-static magnetostatic problem. You just have uh, a field generation, you've got these uh, sort of soft materials, and we ignore the hard biases and uh, say that relationship is true and come up with some functions. Those kind of functions, and if you do those kind of model, that kind of modeling, um, here's a, a sort of a standard system. You come up with a two-dimensional function, which in principle should be quite flat on the top and then uh, go off on the sides with respect to the off-track distribution. This is a two-dimensional impulse response, a read sensitivity function. What we used to use all the time, many people still use it, is just a one-dimensional system, which is a cut down the middle, where we only cared about the downtrack direction. 
again, TDMR is, we need to break these rules, and, and uh, that's too approximate. We have to get more uh, fancy to do this. Okay, so with respect to um, the modeling, let me wrap it up in this simple chart. We are writing in two dimensions, always have, and we're reading in two dimensions at least, and always have been. But now uh, we need to model it uh, this way, or something like this. We've come up with a, a way to characterize the magnetization from the write process, and uh, I'm going to call that function m. It could be the, either the average magnetization, perhaps, or it could be the actual magnetization and that's uh, noisy. I think this one looks more like the noise. And it's a, it's a two-dimensional function. We convolve this with the read sensitivity function. The convolution operation, just adding all the little pieces. You can take each bit of the magnetization, being up or down, and that bit contributes a small piece of that function in either up or down case. And then you add all of the contributions of each part of the media, accumulate them all, since we're calling it a linear system, and you can come up with this fuzzier function of this thing. That is a fuzzification, <laughs> if you like. It's a convolution uh, that is not an impulse, it's a, a broader average, so we get a fuzzy look at what the actual magnetization is like. Okay. So we're almost to what we actually measure when we hook up an oscilloscope to the system. This is a two-dimensional signal, which we don't measure, but we can take a sample of this two-dimensional signal by putting the read head at some position. And if you put the read head at some position and hook up an oscilloscope, you'll see one of these three signals in a one-dimensional signal. This is what happens in real time. And then we can move the head over. We have another head that's identical at another position uh, relative to the writing uh, position, and we'll come up with another signal. And then, then a third position, come up with another signal. And it's the unenviable, unenviable job of the, mag of the uh, signal processing team to generate this pattern from these signals. Yeah. And it's even worse than that, because this is the average signal. This is not the noisy signal. I'll show you what the noisy signal looks like in a minute. <laughs> But it turns out that, in fact, we can reliably take that, those kind of messy signals and very reliably estimate what the written pattern was. How can we do that? Um, we'll talk about that uh, very briefly. Okay. okay, so that's modeling in two dimensions. We looked at a writing model, a stochastic model in two dimensions, and a reading model, which was not stochastic. Um, and uh, related the two to come up with what we actually measure. And while this model is quite simple, it does uh, have something to do with what we actually measure, and, and it provokes a lot of the problems that we actually see. Let's talk a little bit about uh, modeling, and sorry, about testing. Uh, these are fairly compl complex systems. Uh, those of us who want to look at these systems usually want to have a compact description of what all this mess looks like in the actual world. And uh, because there's too many other things that happen that we don't model, even if we get more fancy with these models, we still won't match what we measure because we've, there's things that we've ignored. And so we have to depend on uh, what we actually measure. Certainly when we manufacture hard disk drives, we do not know what the read sensitivity function is uh, to anything to the required uh, accuracy. Uh, from strict theory. We have to measure every head, every radius of every head, maybe 50 radii. And uh, at manufacturing, we'll, we'll spend a lot of time looking at what, uh, identifying that system in manufacturing. So the drives that you use uh, have been characterized in this way. Uh, one of the ways that we found very useful uh, to do that is to write out particular patterns in one dimension. Here's a write current sequence. And then we read back that waveform that was associated with that write pattern. And if the system was linear, we can do a deconvolution operation between what we wrote and what we read and come up with the linear response of the system. That is a compact representation of what should happen uh, if you write out any pattern. We could take this information 
And if you have s sufficient signal processing background, you can generate maybe what would have happened with any particular pattern that you wrote, not just this one. But this one is a very special pattern. It's called a pseudorandom sequence. Um, it is a remarkable mathematic, mathematical object. It creates sequences which are orthogonal with themselves. It, it creates uh, finite fields. Um, it is a fundamental object that's used in many different ways. It's also used in wireless communication systems and your cell phones. But uh, it turns out that if the system was linear, you wouldn't actually care what kind of pattern that you use. But it turns out that our system, perhaps not, not unsurprisingly, is not linear. And uh, when we uh, actually do this kind of system, we do get what we call the linear kernel when we do the deconvolution. But we also see lots of other interesting nonlinearities, which using this kind of pattern only has the magical property that some nice magnetic nonlinearities will constructively interfere in this linear deconvolution at particular locations with respect to the main linear pulse. And we've been able to, over the decades, associate those uh, pulses with particular write phenomena, typically, or read phenomena, that we can optimize and fix in, in many cases. Uh, the standard case in the uh, 80s and 90s was uh, something called nonlinear bit shift, which this is about. The question of this kind of uh, pitch is, well, that's all nice, but what about two dimensions? And I suppose I wouldn't be telling you about it if I didn't say that there also is a two-dimensional pseudorandom sequence, which we, I, have you ever done this? You do a lot of good work and you get all happy and you, def you find that there's such a thing as a two-dimensional sequence by your own work and then you find that somebody already did it in 1960. So, <laughs> um, but I'd at least had fun. Um, it, it turns out that you can create a uh, two-dimensional sequences which have the same signal processing properties as the, as in the, that happen in one dimension. In particular, you have something that has perfect autocorrelation in two dimensions. That is, it's only correlated with itself uh, when it's on top of itself, and if you move in other places periodic-wise, it turns out to be correlated, which is the main property that we need for the system. Uh, and one other property that I won't get into, but you can build these systems by starting out with a one-dimensional sequence, start in the corner, and then uh, increase the radix by one, modulo the dimensions of the param of the matrix, and come up with the system. Here's a more useful one, uh, a 3 by 85 system. And uh, this will represent, when we do it, uh, three different tracks and 85 bits in each track that we will write. And uh, the way we do the measurement is we somehow get these things written down in phase with respect to each other and in the perfectly at the track pitch, and we cyclically extend it in both directions. When we write it, and then we go back and read it at different head locations, and create this kind of a map. The mathematics is one line in MATLAB. We take the, uh, we do a deconvolution of this pattern with what we wrote, and we will come up with the pulse, what's known as the pulse response. And that pulse response looks like this. We now have a, if the system were linear, we would have a, a nice way to look at what happens if we have one bit, one two-dimensional bit, that has both the write and the read processes in it. And uh, we can take this bit and then use it to say, well, what would happen if I had written another two-dimensional sequence just by adding and subtracting this function at every place. The nice part about the system uh, the, the system is, however, not only can we make this nice pretty picture for the linear part, but if there are any nonlinearities, they will show up as echoes of this part, as uh, relative to where we were seeing the, the main pulse. And these echoes have to do with certain Volterra kernels. We won't get into that today, but uh, each of these effects, um, we are still looking at exactly what's causing them. Um, they are both very likely to be effects relative to the demagnetization field uh, that is present as we write these patterns. Yeah. So lots of pretty pictures to be able to make.
Again, in the old days, we'd just do a, a, a pulse response in one dimension. Um, in the cross-track direction, that's what we cared about. Now we care about the entire system. Here's what it looks like in the cross-track direction, which is suddenly important. Just a closer look. Somewhat interesting, and there's good magnetic reasons for the fact that these have uh, negative undershoots. And a uh, lot to learn from this kind of uh, output about what's actually happening in the magnetic system in two dimensions. Finally, uh, I want to discuss a little bit about this uh, peskier version of testing, and that's the read sensitivity function. Did I tell you that uh, you know, the previous stuff I talked about has both the read and the write responses in it? which is not the read sensitivity function. Remember, the read sensitivity function is only what the reader uh, says. Turns out this is a much harder thing uh, to measure. And let me describe the kind of problem and the kind of solutions that uh, I've been finding to be, to be useful. You remember that uh, we started with the magnetization. Uh, we might assume some read sensitivity function. And, these are, and those are related to what we measure by a convolution product. In fact, you can just think of the convolution as a multiplication, a simple multiplication, if you like. So we've got m times r equals x, and we only know x. So what we would like to be able to do is to figure out from x what r is. So let's take the simple case. Uh, in standard one dimensions, we say x times y equals 7. There is no answer to what x is or y. However, if we somebody told you that the x and y were both integers, you actually might have a pretty good guess about what x and y were, even though you only know the product. Okay. And if somebody told you that they were positive, then you've only got two choices. One is seven, one is one. Okay. Um, it's a much more complex system, but that's the same kind of problem that we're associated with here. We generally only know this unless we do a lot of work that maybe Dieter and other folks would do uh, to, de to uh, determine what, by more direct methods, what the magnetization was, but we can't do that very fast or very often. Turns out that we can make a pretty good estimate of what both of them are by constricting what the magnetization could be. Remember, magnetization pretty much can only be up or down at any point, pretty much. We also know that the read sensitivity function itself, even though we might know it, not know its shape, it is uh, very likely to be limited support. It is only around in this area where you have significantly, the function will be significantly away from zero. So it just comes down to this. Can we find a way to use these uh, properties to come up with an estimate of what the read sensitivity function could be? Uh, one way to do that is to make an estimation from this fuzzy version of this of what this is. And the simplest way to do that is just to say that at every point along here, if you have a positive signal, it's pretty likely that the magnetization underneath, directly underneath that is also positive. It might be wrong in a couple places, but that's not a bad approximation. And then... Uh, if it's negative, we'll do the other thing. We'll say if the signal, the two-dimensional signal, is positive, we're going to call the magnetization underneath that point negative. That just means we estimate the magnetization by the sign of this measurement. And then we can come up with the read sensitivity function estimate, which is just this signal divided by deconvoluted with the sign of itself. And when you do that, you'll come up with this function. This is all simulation, but uh, this, you'll have to believe me, turns out to be very like this one, with some junk around it. But we can just ignore the other stuff since we know that the read sensitivity function isn't that close. Okay. So by tricks like this, we can come up with uh, methods uh, by which we can come up with both a magnetization estimate, which is pretty uh, approximate, but the read sensitivity function it was actually quite a uh, quite nice estimate. And uh, here's what we actually see when we uh, take these kind of measurements and look at it. Unlike the fact that uh, it should have looked flat in that original uh, theoretical version I showed you, up in the top is actually quite uh, more sharp than that. You can see a negative undershoot on all sides. This is partly due to this, the soft underlayer showing a negative uh, 
uh, a negative version of the magnetization uh, at a lower resolution. And it's also due to uh, edges in the uh, shields. This is the kind of functions that we will work with. If the head was wider, this would be wider. If the gap was bigger, the gap would be like this. But um, quite a bit more complex uh, system if we care, and we now do care deeply in the, in the TDMR system. Okay, so we've looked at a couple things. Uh, let, let me just in the last two minutes, and I hope to give you some time, uh, time for a couple questions. I want to talk about uh, the kind of signals that we actually see in this system. Um, there's a lot of signal processing to do here, but you remember this big mess? It turns out that we can, using signal processing methods, uh, two-dimensional equalization, um, we can take this kind of, these three signals and regenerate, that is invert the magnetic system, purely by adding and subtracting um, different uh, and local samples, readback samples around those in a particular fashion. We can come up with the original signal uh, that was written. So even though we have that mess, we can come up with this on average. But in fact, what actually comes out of that inversion process is that. Yes, this is what your pictures look like on a hard drive <laughs> if we did that inversion process. The actual nominal values are is plus or minus one that we showed before, but the, uh, the noisiness of the system is what you see here. That is, you can barely see it. And it's one of the magic, uh, one of the magic technologies of a hard disk drive is if we can take that reliably and come up with your bank accounts and uh, uh, quite reliably, we hope. Okay. Um, so there's a, another section of the talk uh, on how we, how we do that, um, but probably we'll call it a day for, for that. Can I have any questions that you have before we go to the next speaker? Okay, that, that's your time, so oh, okay. most welcome. <laughs> yeah, yes, Dieter has a question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, the speed at which we go is kind of, since the magnetics are basically the same in the right process, we haven't really been changing that, although we might care more about the modeling and understanding what's happening there. Um, the simplest cases that will come out first are basically the same read data rates that we come back with today. The, all that extra processing can still be done at speed, which is about three to four gigabits per second. When it becomes interesting, though, is that we can actually use TDMR, the multiple read heads, to come back with multiple tracks at once. That is, uh, we can, instead of just reading one track at a time, we can now read two or three tracks at a time. Now, this one starts to become interesting. <laughs> it's actually not, well, all, we, all we really have to do is to double or triple the size of the, of the recording electronics. But since that is a, a very large part and, a, and big cost of our system today, uh, it's going to be a little bit more of a, it's certainly technically feasible. It may not happen very soon that we would actually double or triple the readback data rate. But it's one of the only, if I could be blunt, one of the only uh, uh, things that hard disk drives have got going them with respect to performance. If we can really pull off twice the sequential readback data rate or triple the readbacks, that will be a, a game-changing influence that might extend the life of hard drives for another several years. Yeah. So we, what is real for uh, the original, for the stuff that comes out uh, in the next, in 2016, we expect somewhere between 5 and 10% and gain, which sounds pretty small. And it is small, historically. But you remember that we're getting desperate now? <laughs> so uh, it, this is actually, you know, 5 or 10% gain is, is maybe uh, two or three years worth of, uh, of gain from other parts of the system. So it turns out to be extremely large. When we add uh, you know, a three-headed system with the kind of signal processing advantages that will really come out, it'll be more like 20 to 25 percent gain is my, is my thought. Still not huge uh, historically, but that is humongous uh, in today's environment. So 
but the first the first stuff that comes out will be uh, five five percent, something like that. Okay. Anything else? If not, uh, may I thank you so much much for your kind attention. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ron.